I'm actually very excited to share this material that has been so relevant and groundbreaking in my own life and my own understanding of what life is. What is this experience? What is spirituality? And I'm quite confident that you will gain something from the synthesis of this material. Before we get into it, the best way to learn and receive information is to be as relaxed as we possibly can. My style is to give out a fair amount of information in a short amount of time, and this is good because there is a recording of this video you can go back to and listen at a later time. I encourage you all to simply relax, to simply tune in, and to allow yourself to receive this information. So it's very important that you leave any preconceived notions, ideas, what life is about. I ask if we could temporarily leave those at the door. And if we could maybe just take a moment now to find ourselves feeling a little bit more settled and maybe just use this moment to Notice what sensual information is coming into our field. Maybe there's some distant sounds, or maybe we can feel our positioning of our feet on the floor, or maybe we can feel our body somewhat being embraced by the chair. And just take this moment to really allow your body to relax. And take a nice, deep, slow breath and allow just everything that you've been learning and exploring, everything that's going on in this time, just let it go for a moment. And take just a few moments to really feel yourself settling down and feeling that embrace, feeling gravity holding you in your chair. And maybe you notice which leg is a little bit more comfortable, which hand is a little bit more relaxed than the other hand. And just really allow yourself to feel settled in your body and relaxed. One of the best ways that we receive information is to be relaxed. And feeling more relaxed now than you did just a moment ago, you know you will be able to receive this information and apply it in your life more easily and effortlessly. I would like to begin by dedicating this talk to those Pluto souls who are experiencing Plutonian lifetimes, those souls who I consider Pluto souls, my heart goes out to you. You know who you are. It is not just your two feet on the earth, but also in the ashes. God bless you. Thank you for being on the planet at this time. You give my heart great hope and great inspiration to continue living my own life. This talk has been tremendously inspired by two terrific souls. That is namely Jeffrey Wolf Green, who I'm sure you're all familiar with as the founder of Evolutionary Astrology. And the second inspiring soul, who I am very much uh, going to be synthesizing his work and material with the understanding of evolutionary astrology in this talk today, is Milton Erickson, the founder of Ericksonian hypnosis and known as the father of modern hypnotherapy. These two Plutonian souls are very much, in my eyes, responsible for bringing Pluto out of the dark. And these two souls have also been tremendous inspirations, not only to me in my life, but to many, many other souls as well. And that is because not only were these two brilliant revolutionaries, they were survivors survivors. And the fact that these two souls survive the life that they lived in and of itself is one of the most inspirational things to me that keeps me going on a daily basis. Jeffrey Wolf Green survived a severely traumatizing childhood and then became a Vietnam War veteran. 
Oftentimes, we think that trauma is what a Vietnam War veteran is. I might argue that Jeffrey Green's childhood trauma was more severe than what he experienced in Vietnam. Milton Erickson, on the other hand, was a survivor of polio. When he was in his teens, he caught the polio virus and became completely catatonically frozen except for his eyeballs. Doctors and nurses surrounding his hospital bed told his mother that this boy was surely to die the following morning. And for that reason, Milton Erickson kept his eyes focused on the window. That way he could see the rising sun the following day. Milton Erickson was a revolutionary who discovered many uh, psychological tools and techniques, some of which we will mention today. Namely, he is the father of utilization, which is using whatever circumstance we find ourselves in in order to transform, transition where we find ourselves. Milton Erickson used muscle memories to heal his own catatonic nature from polio virus. He was able to function most of his life, though later on in his life he was bound to a wheelchair. He suffered incredibly uh, severe pain throughout his life, and yet those who knew him could not tell that he was in any pain at all. He was able to be such a powerful pioneer of hypnotherapy via the polio that he experienced. He became a master of Pluto and Scorpio because he was able to tune into the unconscious nature of the human being while he was unable to move. He was listening to people's tone of voice, pacing, body movements, body language, and in that regard, became a near magician in his capability to read the unconscious as well as to be able to speak and relate to the unconscious in such a way to catalyze powerful change in the lives of others. Jeffrey Wolf Green similarly had a powerful sensitivity and gift of awareness that was born out of the difficulties of his early life situation. One of my favorite Jeffrey Green quotes is that you do not have to like your life. You do not have to like your soul's evolutionary intentions. You just have to do it. That refers exactly to what Ari Moshe just spoke to about Pluto being our soul's evolution. We have the free will to cooperate or to resist, but there is a level of choicelessness. Milton Erickson, quote, life will bring you pain all by itself. We don't have to go looking for pain. Pain will come to us without us having to go look for it. Our responsibility is to create joy. There is a famous Buddhist maxim, and this Buddhist maxim goes something like, if you have begun the spiritual journey, finish it. And if you have not begun the spiritual journey, don't. And it's a little bit of a tongue-in-cheek Buddhist maxim that is acknowledging the challenge of the spiritual journey. And so if you've started this journey, finish it. But it's not a cakewalk. Pluto is the bottom line of our life, of our reason for experiencing the life we do. It is the why behind our life that is founded in evolutionary necessity. Necessity. Everything in our reality rests upon the principle of evolution. All of nature and experience is designed to keep going, to continue at all costs. The Buddha had an analogy that our journey to enlightenment is somewhat similar to a bird flying over a mountain and dragging over that mountain top a silk scarf. 
And the Buddha said, by the time that mountaintop is worn down to nothing, we will be enlightened. That mountain is Pluto. Pluto is mastery, enlightenment. Not exactly where we were looking for it necessarily, right? <laughs> enlightenment found in that planet traditionally associated with the underworld. And isn't it interesting that the Buddha was enlightened in a full moon in Scorpio? That was our full moon just yesterday. In my talk on the moon and lunar nodes, someone asked me about the full moon and I realized that I sort of bypassed it by saying, you know, this affects everybody differently, which is true. But the reason I said that is because this full moon was making me feel very uncomfortable and so I immediately was just like, well, let's not let the cat out of the bag about what Timothy's dealing with over here, because indeed this full moon in Scorpio can also be conflict, intensity, unconscious emotional release. But it is also an opportunity to really see and understand the reality of our deeper unconscious nature. The moon really feels into what's going on in Scorpio beneath the surface, bottom of the barrel. And so that's our full moon just yesterday. And of course, though our moon's now in Sagittarius, the full moon also caricatures this entire lunar cycle. Now, when we are talking about Pluto, there's a couple, how shall I say, uh, We're going to take a look at the nature of Pluto as it relates to the water trine as well as the fixed cross because when we're looking at the zodiac it is as if this is sacred geometry that reflects back fundamental nature. So we discussed some of this water trine in the presentation on the moon yesterday. The soul actually evolves through our personal subjective emotional experience. We evolve through our feelings. Our personal subjective feelings are a personal subjective experience of life as we are exploring our deeper soul's evolutionary intentions, which are unconscious to us, is what allows for this returning to source, returning to nature, and having a sense of purpose and fulfillment instead of this just simply being evolution without purpose. This evolution is bringing us towards our potential as spiritual souls. And that is through the moon, our personal subjective emotional experience. This water trine is the nature of spirit, nature of the soul. Now, we can look at the fixed cross. The fixed cross is related to the nature of the human being in particular, because the fixed cross is correlated to power, sacred creative power, which is particularly emphasized in the human species. Here we see Pluto in opposition to Taurus Venus, which has to do with our body, our senses, somatic processing. Pluto is evolution. Taurus is slowing down to integrate the intensity of evolution into space, into form. And Pluto keeps the stagnation of Taurus from being imprisoning. The real hell is not Pluto transformation. The real hell is being limited. And Pluto paradoxically keeps us from being limited. Uranus, on the other hand, is our own ingenuitive brilliance. There is an evolutionary dynamic with Uranus as well. Uranus is the power to invent by seeing higher perspectives, greater vantage points. Uranus in Aquarius is the future this very advanced part of the human nature that wants to keep progressing. And then, of course, the sun, our personal expression, our individuality. And so the reason why I'm showing this fixed cross as it is correlated to Pluto, as well as the grand trine, is we see a connection here between the nature of spirit and the power of the human being. 
And that connecting point is found in the unconscious, Pluto, Scorpio, the underworld. Scorpio is where the animal ucky muck meets the symbolic language of the soul. And they go hand in hand. And that's what's so profound as well as so liberating when we do our shadow work and explore the underworld. The language of the soul is archetypal, symbolic, and therefore communicated through unconscious instinct. Something that we will speak about today is that it is more effective to create change by speaking or relating to the unconscious mind indirectly. So how can we make Pluto approachable? Well, because Scorpio is unconscious avoidance, it is our fears, paranoias, what we reject, what we don't understand, what is mysterious, what is foreign, what is taboo, oftentimes is suppressed into the unconscious field or realm of Pluto Scorpio. Now, we know that Pluto is traditionally known as a beast or a devil or a demon or dark. And this is due to this suppression, avoidance, denial, as well as misunderstanding of what we do not know. One of the reasons that we project demons and witches and scary dark things onto Scorpio and Pluto is because it is unknown. This is, in fact, an effect of the unconscious, is because we are naturally afraid of the unknown. What's in the dark? We don't know. We tend to invent fear and project it onto the darkness, and that's what demons are. Demons are our own projected misunderstanding of reality, at least in the way that we so have invented demons to be, these hellish beings that only serve to drag us into misunderstanding, which is the way that I'm relating to the word demon here. Patriarchal disbalance is certainly something that has affected Pluto Scorpio, which is a water feminine sign. Scorpio is chaos. We tend to project our mental order of how things should be, how we should behave, onto Pluto, Scorpio, which causes that suppression of that naturally chaotic, feeling-based water sign. And that leads for that suppression, for these unconscious dynamics to become inflamed, distorted, and more hyperreactive, the more we suppress and the more we project our masculine ideas of order, what that should like, how they should behave onto Pluto, that tends to backfire. In reality, we do not know a person until we know their shadow. That's something that's really important to bear in mind. How well you know a person, I would say, you can determine by how well you know their shadow. So a shadow is not something that we're simply trying to resist, deny, avoid, or change into something that's not a shadow. We're learning to form a relationship to our shadow and the shadows of others in a way that's not detrimental but productive. The nature of Scorpio and Pluto is not like a staircase. It wiggles. We don't expect nature to fit into cubes. The truth is we cannot expect the same of ourselves or others or else volcanic eruption, scary demonic face, etc. An actually very common experience of evil that we see out there in the world is when that patriarchal mental order of how a person should be or how they should look like or should or how they should behave oppresses the naturally mysterious and therefore chaotic feminine nature Common occurrences, you know, in school system, little Johnny's parents just died, but he's a hooligan in class, so the rest of the class gets to watch little Johnny get continuously put in trouble throughout the year. There has been societal obstructions to understanding the nature of Pluto Scorpio. You can even go back and look at some old medieval manuscripts that list the zodiac signs, but Scorpio is conveniently missing. 
because it's that taboo, you know? It's like we've got all the body parts, but we don't label the genitals because that's just so wrong, so dirty. So sex, forbidden, suppressed, distorted. Power, suppressed. Power is a gateway to hell. Avoid your power, and then power becomes suppressed, resisted, distorted. The occult, certainly a gateway to hell. We all know about that. <laughs> and death, absolutely no way that's going to happen <laughs> in terms of our societal perspectives. How can we make Pluto our friend? And we know that Pluto is death, the catalyst of evolution, that which is metamorphosis, that which is change, is death. The truth is, death is not just happening sometimes. Death is happening always. We are in a very Plutonian time period, and so we're seeing that theme of death dialed up. We are confronting Plutonian themes now more than of ever. We are in a time period of cataclysmic evolution. And yet that cataclysm and that intensity and that theme of death is what can drive us to live our life to our fullest potential. We can reapproach the fear of death and make the fear of death our friend by understanding this is an inner flame that's going to wake me up to living my life to its fullest. Not to settle or stagnate, but rather Pluto strips us of the false luxury of the true damnation of soul limitation or stagnation. Pluto knows that there's more to our potential. You can be deeper. You can be more powerful. You can be more in your soul's potential. And so we won't let ourselves be limited to these shallow comfort zones. Pluto pushes us beyond our limits, forces us to confront and transcend our personal limitations. Continued unending metamorphosis is to be desired. Continued, unending metamorphosis is to be desired. The desire for continuous, unending metamorphosis is the true crown jewel of all gifts that can be bestowed to the soul. The desire for continuous, unending metamorphosis is the true crown jewel of all gifts that can be bestowed to the soul. There is a very common question that I'm hearing all over the place right now. And this is not a new question. This is a question that astrologers hear all the time for years and years, and it's when is it going to end? When is it going to end? When is it going to end? Folks, that's the best question if you want to torture yourself. When is it going to end? When is it going to end? It's like a child asking during a uh, long trip somewhere, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? It's like watching a kettle boil. The question is not when is it going to end? The question is how can we embrace our life to the greatest potential? To embrace the present moment in the greatest potential, to embrace the experiences that life gives us, good, bad, insane, ugly, or painful. You do not have to like your life. It is about embracing it for its evolutionary potential. Jeffrey Wolf Green was very adamant to point out the differentiation between karma and evolutionary necessity. I see that as being one of the most beautiful medicines in his teachings, especially where in astrology and patriarchal religion, there are these mental constructs of why we experience the life that we do. And here's where we get extremely harmful teachings and distortions, such as good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. Obviously, this idea is misled and rooted in something very different than compassion. Compassion understands that life is not fair. 
that pain and suffering is a natural experience for being born a human being. This is a part of what the Buddha realized when he left his false luxury and distraction from real life. He leaves the kingdom and he sees people sick and people dying and people suffering. So there's a reality to this. But it is not punishment, as Ari Moshe was saying. This is not an accident. This is not just, oh, we must have really messed up in some past lifetime because whoever is running the show up ahead really must not like me or I must really deserve this. We are experiencing what is necessary for our own soul's growth and evolution. Karma is simply the understanding of cause and effect. It is the understanding of the mechanical nature of this universe. If you push something in one direction, it is like a, a pendulum that tends to swing back in the opposite direction. So that's nature. Karma is nature. Karma is form. It's structure. It's how the universe behaves. Evolutionary necessity means that we may sometimes experience very dark, challenging, painful experiences, but it's not simply cause and effect. It comes from a desire rooted in our soul. Now, Jeffrey Green does not say you have to like the desires that are rooted in your soul. And that's called empathy. Empathy is that we have a moon, we have an ego, uh, we don't like the experiences that we have. Uh, nobody likes to get thrown into an uncomfortable situation. Nobody likes, you know, when we sit on a red ant hill, right, and we realize, oh my goodness, this is uh, a rather intense place to sit, <laughs> not very comfortable. And yet, our own alert system and what's waking us up. Again, this motivational force is to be embraced. So we don't always have to like it. We don't have to celebrate life. Enlightenment is not having a superficial smile pasted on your face at all times. That's not necessary. And again, some of these expectations for order or things are supposed to look this way or sound this way or be this nice, which is more of an example of politeness or social cultural expectation rather than real niceness or real empathy. Real empathy, especially in a time like the time we're going through right now, is you are safe to feel whatever you're feeling. It is a healthy time to be depressed. It is a healthy time to feel anxiety. Those are natural experiences to be had going through the passageway that our collective is going through at this time. But it can also be a productive passageway. So we're reframing Pluto from bad, death, transformation, or I'm sorry, hell. And we're reframing hell as transformation. It's not the furnace we are placed within to be punished after we die, but rather the furnace that powers the solar system's locomotive engine. That's Pluto. This mechanism of union, separation, union, separation, intensity, unconscious desires, phobias, magnetic attraction, repulsion. The question is not, when, is, when does it stop? The question is, where is this steam engine going? How can we hop on board? How can we allow the steam engine to be more effective? What can we provide in this locomotive's journey what can we feed that engine to keep that flame burning, to feel that sense of momentum? This is when we really start to get into a level of mastery, when we start to recognize that the value is in the effort rather than the golden sticker star or, you know, the reward. The value is in the effort. That's when we are stepping towards that understanding that the greatest gift that we can receive is ceaseless transformation. That is true devotion to God. Evolution is God's desire. When we align with evolution, this is aligning with God's plan. So, we know traditionally there's been different understandings of Pluto, and as we understand what is the nature of Pluto, the unconscious, this understanding changes. I find it is no coincidence that just a century ago is when we discovered Pluto, and this is when Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung are 
first really discovering and pioneering what is this nature. That's something to really pause and acknowledge and admire is, wow, we're just starting to encounter what this phenomenon, the beast, what is this? We're just starting to understand this. And Pluto's only gone roughly one half orbit since the time of its discovery. And I do think that this is a bit of a reflection of how much we do not know about the unconscious and how powerful the unconscious is. When we realize that we have elected presidents based off of the president's capacity to affect the unconscious, <laughs> essentially through hypnotherapy or hypnotism, we're really going to start waking up to how important it is to understand the nature of the unconscious. This changes our entire life and reality. And some of what we're going to move towards in the second part of this lecture is we're going to start talking about some of these more new approaches and tools and techniques to approach the unconscious. But in the past, darker, more complex archetypes are often scapegoated, and that's not a surprise because they're darker and more complex. They're not easy to understand. They're not just leaving presents beneath the Christmas tree on, you know, Christmas or whatever. It's just like, wow, what is this? I don't know, but it sure ain't fun. So earlier, it's easier to, again, demonize scapegoat, darker archetypes. This has happened to Saturn, this has happened to Pluto and others where that nature is not so much preferred. We use that word patriarchy very, very common in the spiritual new age, astrological communities, depending on where you are. This can be a misleading term depending on how it's used. Commonly it's used and the way that I use it is it describes the societal construct that has been conditioned through centuries. So it's not necessarily just men are the head of the household or father. There's this whole societal construct that has come from that paradigm, and we're going to continue to move through that paradigm. But much of what that societal construct formed itself around was suppressing the nature that was not preferred. Let's transcend death. We're not going to die. Oh, let's not have discomfort. Let's not have conflict. And we create these superficial means of escaping this deeper reality. So again, Pluto's not just death, crisis, calamity, bad, bad, bad. It's not just, oh, you screwed up in a past life and now you've got to eat it. Cataclysmic evolution can be the most intense and painful experience that is also the most intense and fast-paced evolution in a short amount of time. That's the hidden grace of Scorpio, Pluto, Kali Ma. The analogy I like to give for cataclysmic evolution is it is like when this planet was originally inhabited by dinosaurs. Very, very different life forms. And then suddenly an asteroid smacks the earth and kicks up this huge dust cloud. And suddenly all of the life forms on this planet transform in a very fast, a short amount of time. This is evolutionary, uh, cataclysmic evolution. Now, a problem, again, with a traditional approach to Pluto Scorpio is there tends to be a projection of fear of the unknown, which causes more denial, suppression, or avoidance. Expecting Pluto to fit our comfort zone. Judging the instinctual response, which is in relation to unconscious sensitivity. Judging instinctual response, which is in relation to unconscious sensitivity. So someone who could be very Pluto, very Scorpio, receiving the information from the unconscious can be judged for their instinctual response because they're tuned into something they're not consciously aware of, but is real. And then we say, oh, you're crazy or you're too intense, but that may simply be an instinctual response to something that's deep and beneath the surface. Another issue with Pluto is we tend to approach this part of our life or our charts from a moral perspective. 
What that means is that we are coming from that perspective of, oh, this is where your soul has had so much experience, and so you should be having a different experience now. You should be expanding out of your unconscious comfort zone. And when, you, when we approach Pluto from that more moralistic or analytical perspective, it is not as effective to create actual change. So when we're talking about shadow work, what we're talking about is reframing the parts of ourself that we are naturally or instinctually repulsed by. You know, these tends to be the things that people re reflect back to us as insults, for example. We get very, very hurt from an insult, and we should never hold on to an insult. Milton Erickson said, if anybody ever insults you, you don't hold on to that. You take it to the nearest garbage can. If somebody gives you garbage, can, gives you garbage that's not yours. That doesn't belong to you. That belongs to the garbage can. But as we're living our life, there tends to be these blind spots, Pluto, that we get woken up to, and we recognize that they're blind spots. We recognize they're not always conscious to us. We recognize that these, therefore, become areas of difficulty in our relationships and interactions with others. And so how do we approach these parts of ourselves? Well, if we're so hurt, there's an initial defensiveness Oh, that's not how I am. That's not what I'm about. That's not what I do. And so we are reapproaching these parts of ourself by seeing what are the positive qualities within the parts of ourself that we have previously only deemed as negative, repulsive, or bad. That's one way to begin shadow work because it makes approaching these difficult parts of ourself more approachable. That really begins this momentum of being able to approach our deeper unconscious nature rather than resisting that deeper unconscious nature. I'll give an example here. Someone gets called a bitch all the time. Oh, everyone thinks I'm a bitch. Everyone thinks I'm mean, you know. Maybe that person gets accused as being, you know, intense and, you know, they, they snap and they sentence, you know, say what they feel instantly. No, I don't like that. Yeah, that's all right, you know. And so what are the positive qualities in being a bitch? <laughs> Not typically how we think about things, but there is a real magic in this technique because it also leads us into a recognition that there's really no all good or all bad in life. That's a very, very misled belief. When we are learning astrology, this understanding of nature gets more deeply and deeply understood. Squares are not bad, trines are not good. You can see someone use a trine in a terrifically horrible way, and you can see someone use a square in a wonderfully inspirational way. So it's not what it is, it's how we're relating to it. It's not what it is, it's how we are using it. Utilization is approaching something and using it in a different way. Reframing is the same dynamic. So someone who's called a bitch, you know, I don't like that. No, thank you. Instinctfully also could be a master of boundaries. This person is excellent at preserving their own boundaries. This is a person who is excellent at preserving their own power, self-preservation. No, thank you. This is what I'm about, you know. Now, this person doesn't want to remain a bitch, but what's going to paradoxically help this person be less of a bitch is to embrace the positive qualities that goes hand in hand with what's been considered a negative nature. Because if we embrace the positive qualities of the negative nature, then we're not just suppressing and resisting, and I'm not going to ever be a bitch, because that encourages us to sacrifice our need for boundaries. Oh, so yeah, I'll just be really nice, and yeah, I love that, I really love that. Does that work? No. That's called being fake. That's called pretend. And there is a very, very, very common phenomenon in the spiritual realm, spiritual worlds, communities, demographic, regardless of where, who, what religion, new age or not, where we do a spiritual bypass. 
you know, oh yeah, everything's fine, everything's good, it's it's all great, it's all wonderful. We all say it's all great and it's all wonderful, so it's all great and it's all wonderful, and it's not necessarily all great or wonderful. That's disassociation, that's bypassing, that's avoidance. Uh, this is very common in cult-like uh, groups. Well, we would never want to criticize the cult, you know, or the religious belief, or if there's a guru with authority, you would never want to criticize that. You know, we're going to get sent to hell. We're going to get kicked out of the group. And so we make everything really nice and really beautiful and all wonderful, and we say everything politely, and we cover everything all nicely on the surface. This is very, very common in spiritual New Age communities everywhere and across the board, and it is the antithesis of shadow work. And by doing shadow work, you will begin to recognize, wait a minute, why are we avoiding and denying it when we could talk about this stuff that we're avoiding and denying so that way we can change this stuff? Maybe there's some buried gems in all of this conflict or all this drama or all of this intensity. How many of you have been a part of a cult where there, or, or a part of a commune where there's been all sorts of drama and all sorts of intensity that gets swept under the rug because it's considered inappropriate, because that's mean and that's not spiritual. <laughs> We're getting some yeses already. And as a result of that suppression and avoidance of the drama, does the drama go away or does it fester and become meaner and more intense and more bullshitted and more avoided? That's how we create our demons. We suppress, deny, and avoid, and then project our fears onto that which we are suppressing, deny, denying, and avoiding ourselves. And that is also why we will attract people that we have to demonize. We have to make bad guys in order to avoid the fact that, hey, maybe we don't have everything perfectly figured out ourselves. Doing shadow work, doing Pluto work is a true road to humility. The nature of Pluto does not fit into societal, cultural expectations or obligations. We cannot expect our own unconscious to behave like an adult. When we're doing our shadow work, we're not approaching this nature, this resistance, this part of ourselves that's ugly and scary and we'd rather avoid it. We're not going to relate to that part of ourself like, hey, can we have a rational adult conversation can you please you know stop your uh, intensity you know your magnetic attraction or repulsion no pluto the unconscious is like that of a child when we're relating to our own pluto and we're relating to a pluto in another person's chart i encourage us to relate to that as if we were relating to a child Milton Erickson quote, how many of us really appreciate the childishness of the unconscious mind? And we can use that childish nature rather than to try and change it. Use the childish nature to approach the child, to speak to the child, and to transform the nature of those unconscious dynamics. When we are approaching Pluto in our chart, we must approach these parts with delicacy. Stephen Forrest referred to Pluto in the chart as where the soul is wounded. So Chiron, Pluto, we must approach with delicacy. This is where there's been so much intensity, so much gravity, so much past life experience, that this is something that we need to respect that nature. We also don't want to over-traumatize someone with over-exposure to their blind spots, unconscious propensities, or ulterior motives. We're not saying, yeah, you're a bitch, Janet, because you really said that thing and it came off the wrong way. I mean, we could say that, but again, if we want to affect positive change in Janet's life, we would probably approach it in a different way. We would probably be saying, you know, Janet, how do you feel about that situation? And how did you feel when you said that? And then we're getting information. This is how I felt when I said that. And then we speak to that from Janet. Oh, this is how you felt, Janet. And so this is something we're going to honor. And this is something that we're going to hold a space for. 
that way that inner child's propensity and how it may have unconsciously reacted or misbehaved can be understood with the clarity of forgiveness and therefore a way to embrace these dynamics. This is all, by the way, easier said than done. I don't claim to be a Pluto master myself. I am just taking the curriculum. It is better to provide the space and guidance for others' own discoveries <laughs> rather than trying to bring that awareness to others, right? When we see someone stuck in their blind spot, it's really easy to just want to pull them out and say, hey, look at this instead. Hey, you're like really stuck in your shadow, and so you should just be grateful about how wonderful your life is, right? That person has to discovery has to discover their gratitude. You can't just say to someone, be grateful, or it will backfire by making that person feel guilty or ashamed that they're not more grateful than they already are. So we have to remind a person of what they're grateful for by leading them into that gratitude much more like a child. Notice how fresh the scent of air is when you take that breath and how beautiful the sun is overhead and how wonderful your home is that you will return to at the end of the day and how wonderful it is to have the opportunity to share this at your work. And, you know, maybe you don't feel resonant with the people that you're working with. Maybe you're feeling lonely, but this is an opportunity for you to find more people, and you will. And that's exciting. So we don't say to somebody, this is how you should be. I hope that this is coming through as the differentiation between astrology interpretation that's damaging versus astrology interpretation that is healing. And I will just blatantly say that this is information that is missing from the majority of the astrological community. And people are genuinely unaware of how much we damage our clients or other people because we do not approach the chart this way. We say, well, if you've been doing the work this way, this is going to be a time of benefit and things are really going to be paying off. And what that does is shame people going through difficult experiences. We cannot moralistically approach life in this Pluto dimension. Oh, if you've been doing the work, you've got a great life is the same as to say good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. That is a very outdated patriarchal belief that is rooted in uh, bypassing, helping those who are suffering. The king doesn't have to help those who are suffering because those who are suffering, well, they're of a lower caste, right? Very, very failed understanding of this life where we are all learning and growing in compassion. Emphasizing Pluto in the chart, we're getting to a base note for the rest of the reading, meaning addressing Pluto themes can be carried throughout a reading, and how I recommend this is through indirect suggestion. Now I'm going to pause here and check in with questions. And I'm going to do this maybe twice more throughout this presentation. If you have any questions about the material that I am presenting, please feel free to ask a question. What is your view on childhood abuse and embracement? I experienced the past stays with me alive as a shadow or a demon. Yes, those who have experienced severe trauma that is the nature of living with severe past trauma. Does that mean that we will always have that hanging over us as a wound or pain? No, it does not. But it does mean that this life is about healing. I'm very called to work with those who have experienced trauma. And the way that I work with people who experience trauma is it's not about getting to this superficial Disney world, everything is love and light and we're happy all the time because that's not real life. What's so much more traumatizing to the person who's experienced trauma is this culture gives this message that you're alone, that you're isolated, that you're not understood for the nature that you're living with. 
And so the real healing that is needed is trauma awareness. I'm going to speak to this very much in my presentation tomorrow about entering the age of Aquarius. We are in a widespread mental, uh, mental health pandemic, a global mental health pandemic at this particular time. Trauma is universal. Trauma is experienced by everybody, but it is experienced in different degrees by different people. So we are learning to heal. That's everyone's life. And the most important thing about healing trauma is that there's no correct way or pace. There's no time limit. There's no need to skip to the finish line. That pressure or expectation coming from some of these new age communities is trauma shaming. To say, do this meditation, do this yoga posture, it's going to fix everything, ends up shaming people with trauma because that's not real life. Those with trauma, one baby step after the next, we're learning how to form healthy social interactions. We're learning to share what we love with others. And we're learning to participate in a world where we can live, where we can survive. Milton Erickson couldn't move his body and he learned to function, to live his life in those limitations. Similarly, when we're working with trauma, that trauma is going to be at the root of our own healing. And so this is the important understanding. The healing journey and the spiritual journey is non-different. Your trauma is therefore the hidden blessing of your own spiritual journey slowly unfolding. And the real gift is to appreciate that unfolding much like we appreciate the unfolding of the springtime flowers rather than try to force those flowers open prematurely, which has more of a tendency of those flowers falling apart in between our fingers. So it's a very good question. Again, if we've experienced severe trauma early on in our life, that is almost to say we have kick-started our spiritual journey early on I began by devoting this talk to Pluto's souls, not just their feet on the earth, but their feet in the ashes. Pluto is the evolutionary force that keeps us going. There is a most hidden and mysterious blessing to those souls that experience severe trauma and pain. That is not something that needs to be understood. I would never say to someone in severe trauma or pain, oh, this is a wonderful blessing. That is to be discovered. And there is no correct time limit or pace to our own soul's healing. When we begin to project those expectations onto others is when we really begin to create some of these difficulties in our interactions. I'm not going to take Pluto through the houses in this talk I recommend Jeffrey Wolf Green's Pluto One Book for the most excellent and in-depth Pluto Through the Houses talk. I had a Pluto Through the Houses workshop. I took it offline because I decided it was not the best that it could be. Jeffrey Green's material is quite heavy and intense, and some people were not happy by the forcefulness of being woken up to their Pluto unconscious dynamics. So I took it offline. However, if you're interested, I will send you that workshop. Email me. You can uh, contact me on my website. I'll write my website here in the chat. That workshop is also three hours long to take Pluto through the 12 houses in a summary version. <clears throat> So someone asked, can you speak to how to address to Pluto, speaking to Pluto indirectly when reading to a client? Yes, we're going to get to that next. Does self-acceptance seem easier with age or any other factor? I have found with continued age that age should mean something, but it does not necessarily, depending on the individual, depending on the soul. We're all learning and growing as time goes on, though, hopefully. Okay, someone, all right, I'm not going to be able to get into the specifics of Pluto in uh, aspects and houses. How does one get in touch with their shadow even if they don't know what their shadow is? That's a terrific question. 
And here I think of Ram Das, who said, if you really want to understand your spiritual journey, go home and spend a couple weeks with your family. <laughs> so there's one suggestion. <laughs> go spend a couple weeks with your family. Relationships. Relationships is what opens us up to our shadow more than anything. Right? Intimate relationships. That means you actually have to spend time with somebody, not just doing these superficial, uh, you know, YouTube comment conversations, right? That's not an actual relationship. So we learn about our shadow through intimate relationships. Scorpio. Scorpio is the sign that follows Libra. Libra is like first dates, ice cream cones, going to the movies. This is what I like. This is what you like. Let's learn about each other. Air sign. And then we enter Pluto. Scorpio. This is when prince and princess live happily ever after. They roll the credits and we don't see five minutes after happily ever after. Happily ever after is the cultural uh, invention. <laughs> Prince and princess live in a castle in a claustrophobic environment stuck to each other for years and then lives happily ever after. Not realistic. <laughs> Not realistic. Our intimate relationships serve us by reflecting back our shadow. Relationships have a function. It's not just to have fun and enjoy things with, although that can certainly be a part of it. Relationships come straight from Pluto. We are magnetically attracted and repulsed from certain people by Pluto dynamics. We find ourselves in relationships with folks that we are there to learn things from necessarily. So as uh, Ari Moshe mentioned, the composite chart, you know, this is revealing the nature of a relationship and the actual function of a relationship is to evolve through relationship. A healthy relationship is when two souls come together and devote one another to helping one another in their individual evolutionary journey. And this tends to happen the more that we know somebody, sit with them, get to spend time with them, because that's when one person's unconscious field begins to create a tension and a friction with another person's unconscious field. And through that friction, we get woken up to our shadow. This is why I have a very different understanding of conflict as not being inherently negative. To say that conflict is negative is to avoid conflict, is to avoid shadow work, period. We're not avoiding conflict. We're learning to do it healthily, which is not necessarily easy. Because when one person's unconscious field is creating a friction with another person's unconscious field, we tend to have eruptive volcanic feelings. And those eruptive volcanic feelings come straight from Pluto, straight from our shadow, and that's how we wake up to our shadow. So necessarily to get in touch with our shadow, we need intimate relationships. That means we can talk about our deepest feelings in a safe space. If we can talk about our deepest feelings in a safe space with a friend who is capable of providing a space for healthy conflict, that to me is a real friend. My real friends are the ones that call me out on my shit, right? That's a real friend, right? A real friend says, you got your head up your ass, Tim. A real friend says, you're, you're having a narcissistic temper tantrum, Tim. And I say, after I'm finished having my narcissistic temper tantrum, of course, because when you're reactive in shadow, you're reactive in shadow. You're not even really in the body at that point. You are disassociated and in a reactory state. But when I come back to my, my body, I say, thanks for calling me out. Thanks for holding me to my shit. That is a real friend. And let me tell you, real friends are rare. Real friends are rare. Because most people, as I understand, are not courageous enough to point out to another person their own shadow. Because it is easier just to let that go. But then we let it go. We be the bigger person. And then we repress our feelings. And then those feelings end up blowing up. So is it the being the bigger person to repress our feelings. I will tell you from personal experience, no.
<clears throat> what is a Pluto soul? So one of the ways that you can see if someone's a Plutonian soul is how many planets are aspecting a person's Pluto. If we see Pluto aspecting everyone's planets, that's a signature that this soul wants to evolve quickly, intensely. If we see all the planets in the eighth house, if we see all those planets in Scorpio, it's a signature of a soul desire to, intend to evolve quickly. That is who I am terming a Pluto soul. Someone's asking about how do we know about uh, shadow going way, way back to childhood. That can be the usefulness of the unconscious. You can actually use hypnotherapy to access the unconscious. The unconscious knows more than we do. Um, the unconscious has all of our memories from all of our past lifetimes, and that can be accessed. Even memories that have been blocked due to childhood trauma or memories that we have forgotten can be accessed. It's all contained in the unconscious. Hypnotherapy just simply allows us to relax enough to access the unconscious mind. Now, someone asked, how can we approach, we mentioned, approaching Pluto dynamics in a birth chart indirectly? What does that mean? And so I'm going to give an example of indirect suggestion. And why indirect suggestion is more useful in catalyzing a particular change than a direct suggestion. So, you may notice that as we sit here together, it just becomes easier and easier to simply let go and become totally absorbed in the sound of my voice. And hearing me speak just a little slower and a little deeper. Notice how your body automatically responds without you having to do or think anything. Your breath deepening, your arms, your legs, just letting go. And your eyes are beginning to close. And you're going to feel even more deeply relaxed. And isn't it interesting to know, with your eyes closed now, that feeling so held where you are, whether you're sitting down or laying down somewhere, comfortably, that your eyes feel so much more heavy and you feel just so much more relaxed now than you did just a few moments ago. And you feel more relaxed with each and every breath, so slow, deep, cleansing, and reinvigorating every breath you take fills you with a charge. And I wonder if you can already feel that spark of joy, that brilliant warmth spreading all throughout your body now. And I wonder if you can feel that healing love and gratitude in your heart now. Knowing you can feel this way anytime you wish. Because you know you can let the unconscious do so for you. Simply by being here and listening to my voice, and now you are remembering your deeper nature. You are coming back to your higher power, learning and growing every day through your life experience. And knowing this is true, knowing this is your power and potential, and feeling this is true, 
And feeling this is your power and your potential. Feeling this depth in your heart and your soul. You are returning to your more conscious, alert, and attentive mind now. Feeling refreshed and energized. And when you are ready, you can now open your eyes. Now, this was just a really quick script that I wrote in about 10 minutes last night. And if you felt anything from that, that would be an example of how indirect suggestion is more effective than if I were to say, sit in your chair and feel relaxed. <laughs> sit in your chair and, and appreciate this talk. <laughs> you know, maybe a little less effective. Now, the more we speak to the unconscious, and if I were doing an, an astrology reading, I'd be speaking you to 60 or 90 minutes. And what I can guarantee practically everybody by the end of a 60 or 90 minute talk, they are already in a trance. Therefore, we can provide these indirect suggestions throughout the reading, little spritzes here, here, here. And isn't it interesting to know how you feel so much safer in trusting your own inner guidance? And isn't it interesting to know how you feel so safe and at home? in your own emotional feedback. And isn't it interesting how you don't depend on other people's reaffirmations the way you did once before? Isn't it interesting how that old chapter is now over and closed? We speak with confidence to reaffirm the person's soul, to give that person the confidence in embracing their soul's nature. So when a child stubs their toe, we don't say, don't think about your toe. <laughs> it's quite common that we hear that. Oh, little Johnny stubbed his toe. Little Johnny, just don't think about it. Come on, little Johnny. Just It's in your mind. Just don't think about it, little Johnny. And of course, what we are indirectly referring the child to think about the toe when we're saying, don't think about the toe, what we're actually saying is, little Johnny, your toe really hurts. That's terrible, right? <laughs> don't think about your toe is to say indirectly, think about your toe. So what do we say instead? Wow, Johnny, isn't it amazing how much better you feel now that I've given you a big, big hug? Come here, little Johnny, let me give you a big, big hug. Remember, Taurus, Venus, opposite to Pluto, Scorpio, somatic therapy, relaxation is a key to unlocking the power and the transformation of Scorpio. Isn't it amazing how much better you feel now that I've given you a big, big hug? And you can feel that hug, and you can feel how medicinal that was, little Johnny. So the real transformational work is in simply getting to the point of deeply knowing we can change. As astrologers, that's what we want to be giving to our clients. Our clients are going to ask for something, and whatever that something is, we're doing the best that we can to give that to them simply by letting them know that they can, that they can create change in their life. And one of the best ways to bring that recognition that they can create change in their life is to bring them into the actual visceral feeling or experience that serves a reminder that that change is possible. Isn't it amazing how much better you feel now that I've given you that big, big hug? Is a reminder that you can change the pain in your toe by redirecting how you're focusing and where that focus is. That's largely the work that we can do as astrologers give people the understanding that they can change, that they can do what they want to do. But people usually ask for things that they believe that they can't. And that's why we have to affect change in the unconscious field rather than just in the conscious mind. We're not just saying in a person's chart, well, of course we can just say, but I'm encouraging us to do more than just do the labels. Oh, Mercury and Gemini are very, very talkative. You know, these are wonderful things. We can uh, use all of that in astrology. But normally someone's wanting something from an astrology reading. 
And what people don't know is that if we understand the nature of the human psyche, we can do a little bit more than just recite the technological jargon. We can actually maybe recite that technological jargon, but in such a way that will elicit effective change. The symbolic language of the unconscious is through somatic sensations. For example, you know, smell is very connected to memories, feelings, connection between Taurus and Scorpio. Somatic sensation can trigger a desired effect. You will feel your hand and it will have this effect. Uh, people who have stage fright or things like that will oftentimes work with the somatic therapy. I'll feel the tension and the releasing in my hands and then using that feeling of what it feels like to release my hand, I can send that feeling throughout the rest of my body and my psyche. Using the somatic to send a message to the unconscious. Uh, this has been used in rituals since the dawn of time, right? Uh, this is so many ancient practices, what the high priestesses were doing, uh, we'll burn this incense and we'll do this ritual and we'll say this mantra and we'll have these flowers and we'll have these candles. And it's all symbolic, devoted or honoring some deity, some essence to connect directly to that deity, that essence, carry out some work, carry out some transformation. Any sense can be a sigil, heard, seen, smelled, we can create a sigil that affects the unconscious. I'll just do this really quickly. This is a technique that's used in a magical practice throughout the centuries. And I know that uh, Nadia Shah mentioned the Picatrix, and uh, this is some of the magic coming from the Picatrix, is creating sigils. We can actually create our own sigils. This is just one technique to do it, but you can take an uh, intention, a desire, a goal, and write it down, you know, uh, I want to, f you know, we wouldn't say I want to because you want it to be specific. I feel safe and at home wherever I am. Write it down. Take out the repeating letters. Take out the vowels and you will have remaining letters, a string of random letters. And you play with those string of random letters and turn it into some kind of symbol and this takes time, you know, it's an unconscious manifesting. What does that symbol look like that kind of reflects the intention? And then we meditate on that sigil. We let it bleed into our unconscious. We're not remembering what the original phrase was. In fact, it's better to forget it. Maybe forget about the sigil and return back at a later time. And we, we will create a symbol that has within it impressed that intention because what we do is we actually invoke life and consciousness into that symbol through our own unconscious. And creating sigils this way can be very, very powerful because uh, it's as if these sigils take on a life of their own. They are empowered by our own uh, unconscious nature to run all by themselves. That's what a real master does. They run all by themselves. You practice, practice, practice something until it's unconsciously natural to you. And that's when you're a real master. That's when the unconscious is doing it all by itself. Okay. So we're getting towards the end here. Making friends with Pluto. Kali Ma, Shiva. Have you seen the image of Kali Ma on top of the prostrated Shiva lying belly up Kalima dancing on Shiva's motionless body. This is how we relate to Pluto. A Pluto transit is we must embrace, we must cooperate, the dance, the intensity of Kalima. I don't get that we're, uh, oh, we're over time. Okay. I will wrap up then. <clears throat> High octave Pluto is to be an inspirational force in the world, to catalyze change through showing up, to encourage others to overcome their limitations, to be like a black hole of magnetism, irresistible. I don't have time to give example charts or to talk about the current transits, but again, 
my heart goes out to those who are experiencing this Plutonian time. I honor those Pluto souls who are living a life of intensity because their soul desires to bring them into a level of mastery. Thank you for being out there in the world. And I also thank all of you out there in the world at this time, going through this intense Plutonian passageway. Thank you for being in your soul's power, for not resisting the nature of this life, but embracing even these hard times. That way we can use these hard times to create something truly beautiful and a world worth living in.